What is going on guys, welcome back. In today's video, we're going to learn how to properly use IPython notebooks for data science work. And in particular, we're going to focus on Jupyter notebooks, so you can use IPython notebooks in VS Code and PyCharm and so on, but our focus is gonna be on the Jupyter notebook. And this video is not only for those of you guys who have never used a Jupyter notebook before, even though we are going to start from scratch, like from the installation and some basic stuff first, but we're going to also cover some more advanced functions, some more advanced commands, and maybe you didn't know all of them. So this can also be interesting for those of you guys who have been using Jupyter notebooks for quite some time already. So let us get right into it. All right, so obviously the first thing that we want to do is we want to install the Jupyter Notebook application onto our system. And for that, we open up a command line and we type pip install notebook like that. We can press enter and you can see it has a bunch of requirements here. And this is how you do the installation if you're not using Anaconda. Now, this video is not going to be about Anaconda, so we're going to ignore that. But just keep in mind, if you are using Anaconda, you don't have to install anything. You just have to create your environment, activate it, work in it, because you have the Jupyter Notebook already inside of the Anaconda environment. If you're not using Anaconda, you type pip install notebook. The next thing that you do is you go to your working directory. So you create a directory where you want to work in, and then you navigate to that directory. So in my case, I'm going to go to desktop, then to programming, to neural nine, to Python, and then to current, this is my path for my working directory, you choose whatever you have on your system for your working directory. And here you type now Jupyter notebook. And you will see that when I press this and chances are you have to restart your command line in case it doesn't recognize Jupyter notebook uh, command. But you can see that this now opens the web browser and it's hosted on localhost port 8888. Now, before we do anything here, before we continue, I'm going to close this and I'm going to press control C a couple of times to interrupt the Jupyter notebook. And why are we doing that? Because let's say you want to host a Jupyter notebook in your local area network and you have a second computer or a laptop or some coworker that wants to access the same Jupyter notebook that you're hosting. If you're hosting it at localhost, this will not work. So you have to host it at your private IP address, uh, your private IPv4 IP address. And uh, for that, what you can do is you can type Jupyter notebook dash dash IP equals and you can provide the IP. Now, if you don't know your private IP address, you just type IP config and you can see here the IPv4 address for the Ethernet adapter. In my case, this is what we're looking for. So I can right click this, copy it, and then I can type Jupyter notebook dash dash IP equals. There you go. Enter. And now this is going to be hosted, as you can see, um, on this URL. And if I type this URL, including the token on my second laptop um, in the same local area network, then I'm going to be able to access the same application that is running in the browser from there as well. Now, one more thing that I would like to mention before we go into the actual um, tutorial on the Jupyter Notebook itself is that in PyCharm and VS Code, you can also use Jupyter Notebooks or IPython Notebooks. You don't have to use the web interface. You can just go in PyCharm, for example, here, right click, new, and then Jupyter Notebook. I'm gonna call this test. And you can see now we have here a Jupyter Notebook. I personally don't like the PyCharm interface as much as the web interface. Um, so I'm, I'm usually using the web interface or Jupyter Lab. And I think I'm gonna make a tutorial on Jupyter Lab uh, quite soon. But you can do the same thing in VS Code. You have a bunch of editors in IDEs that support using IPython notebooks. So that's kind of interesting to know. But we're going to focus on the browser here. And if you want to create a new Jupyter notebook in the browser, you can just click here at the top right on new Python 3. And then this starts a new notebook. And now we can write our Python code into individual code cells like this one here. And this is the biggest difference between a Jupyter notebook and an ordinary Python file. You can run individual code cells. You don't have to run the full script every time you change something. For example, let me show you um, how this works. If I say A equals 10, B equals 20, I can press now control and enter to execute that code cell, or I can press shift and enter to execute that code cell and start a new one. And um, now what I can do here in this separate code cell is I can say print a plus b and I can enter, I can I can do again control enter and this gives me the result 30. 
And that's the interesting thing here. Now I don't have to run this code all the time, I have to run it once, then these variables are stored in the kernel. Um, and then I can just just work with them in individual code cells, which means that here I can also say something like C equals uh, B divided by A, and then I can run this and I can say print C and I don't have to do this print statement. I don't have to do this again. I can just print C. I can work with C. I don't have to run all of these cells, even though I can. So I can uh, press shift and enter all the time to run them again. And you can also see here by looking at the number, uh, which cell was executed when. So you can see the order of execution here. And this is already the biggest, the, the biggest advantage, in my opinion, when you work with Jupyter notebooks in the machine learning or data science field, because oftentimes what we do in machine learning is we pre process data, we explore data, and we have multiple plots, and then we train a huge model, maybe it takes like 20 minutes, or even I don't know, two hours or five hours to train a model. And then we want to use that model. And of course, we don't want to train the model every time in order to use it, we want to train it once store it and we want to have it in the RAM, we want to have it active and available and we want to just apply certain things or we want to change one or two things about the model, but we don't want to run all of the pre processing and exploration code every time we make a minor change in the code. So this is why this is a uh, very, um, very beneficial when it comes to data science work. Um, also, the Jupyter notebook has a lot of display options, or uh, it shows us certain things in a in a better way than the default command line does. So let me give you an example here, if we have something like um, import pandas data reader as web and chances are you have to install this by typing pip install pandas dash data reader. If you don't have it, this is just an example reader like this. Um, and then I can store a data frame, for example, wet dot data reader and I want to have, for example, the Tesla share price from the Yahoo Finance API. And I can now run this, this is going to load the data, and then I have the data frame. And I can just type DF here without a print statement even and if I execute this cell of code, you can see that the data frame is displayed here in a very beautiful way. And I can also see okay, how many columns, how many rows do I have. And um, yeah, I can say, for example, hat and 100. So I can see 100 or actually 100 is too much. Let's go with 10. I can see the first 10 rows and all that. So this is um, quite nice when you're working with data sets, I can also call the different uh, functions here like info. Or I can, for example, also, I don't think in, in this case, it will give us much information, but I can call the plot function. And this gives me a plot uh, right here, or I can call the hist function. And this gives me histograms right here. So this is kind of interesting, um, how the Jupyter notebook allows us to see the plots immediately without plotting without saying PLT show without printing anything we get. Um, we get um, visualizations and we get data displayed without having to actually force the display using a print statement or using matplotlib show and something like that. Um, so this kind of cool. And this brings me to the next point, which is we have certain magic commands. And at the end of the video, or at the later part of the video, I'm going to talk more about some more advanced uh, magic commands. But one magic command that's kind of interesting is the matplotlib command. So we can say matplotlib, and then we can specify where the graphs should be displayed. So I can say matplotlib inline, which I think I'm not sure is the default. So uh, when I say plot, I, I'm not sure if this applies to pandas as well, but I think it should. Um, this is in line because it's plotted right below. When I change this here to for example, TK, this plots this in TK inter this plots this using a TK, TK inter window, as you can see. And if I change this to QT five, chances are I have to restart the kernel. Uh, yeah, because it says cannot change to a different GUI toolkit. So here you can click on this button to restart the kernel, then basically everything is reset it. Uh, and I would have to run everything again, you can see one, two, three now. Um, and here I now have QT five, which opens this like that. And I can then change this again to inline to have it inline in the Jupyter notebook. So that's kind of cool uh, that we can do that. Uh, besides that, the Jupyter notebook does not only support uh, code sections. So all we see here are code sections, and we have plots, we can also change here if we're in a cell uh, in a cell like this one, 
I can also change this here to Markdown. And Markdown is essentially something um, like a language encoding, you could say, for formatting certain, I don't know what you would say, documents. So I can say, for example, one hashtag is a large heading, and then I can say hashtag, hashtag, smaller, and then hashtag, hashtag, hashtag is smallest. And then I can do something like hello world. This is and then I can say star star bold. And this is star italic. And then if I press control enter, uh, or actually shift enter in this case, you can see that this is converted into markdown. So we can use Jupyter notebooks to actually uh, really have a notebook, not just code being executed, not just a development environment, but also documentation environment. It's literally a notebook, we can write stuff, we can uh, use the markdown. If, if you know mar markdown, you can use markdown here in the Jupyter notebook. So I think if I say a list of items, and then I don't know, like that test, test two, test three, this should give me a list, there you go. So this is something you can do. Another thing you can do, and this is actually quite fascinating, I think is you can actually execute LaTeX code. So you can actually uh, build formulas using LaTeX by just providing uh, dollar dollar, and then we can do something like phi, which is a Greek letter, and then to the power of n, and then dollar dollar. And if I uh, actually, this did not work, I think, do we need to put that into markdown? There you go. So if we have this in markdown, this works, and then I can say, okay, plus of backslash phi, and then to the power of n minus one or something like that, you can see that this is executed into LaTeX code, we can also do something more advanced, we can also provide this magic command, we can use the magic command percent percent LaTeX like that. And then we can uh, just use the whole section here. So I can type begin, and then align, then end align. And then in here, I can type again, the same thing that I typed here, but without the dollars. So we don't have to provide the dollars to specify this as LaTeX because the whole thing is going to be interpreted as LaTeX. And then you can see what this looks like. So this is kind of cool, especially if you want to document certain things, if you want to, um, basically work, 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 and then you want to specify, okay, what I'm doing here with this code is basically doing that function or something like that, or proving that equation, I don't know, whatever you're doing, if you're doing some machine learning work, maybe you want to write for yourself when you're studying when you're learning that this certain function is the activation function of a certain uh, model, whatever. This is kind of cool that you can do that here. And then we also have some more advanced magic functions. And those are actually quite interesting. I think that a lot of people that do know Jupyter notebooks and have been using Jupyter notebook notebooks for quite some time, also don't know these magic commands. And for example, a simple one is just a time it command. So we can type percent time it. And then uh, I can use a pass statement now and I can run this. And basically what this does is it executes the statement after the time it uh, a couple of times. Um, so you can see here, uh, 100 million loops each seven runs. Uh, and you can see here what the average time is the mean uh, and the standard deviation of the time it takes to execute a pass statement. We can also do something else we can do print. Hello, for example, and then you can see here it executes actually the print statement hello. And once it's done at the bottom, we should be able to see here that this takes about 50 microseconds plus minus 1.52 microseconds of standard deviation. And you can do that with all sorts of commands to just see how long it takes on average to execute that. And if you want to execute a larger uh, section of code, you can just type percent percent time it. And then down below, you can write the, uh, the full cell, for example, I can say print one, print two, and then if I run the whole section here, you can see that it runs both of the things. And in the end, we're still gonna get a time report hopefully, there you go. You can see that this takes almost 100 microseconds, which makes sense because one statement was around 50 microseconds and two are going to be twice as long. Um, yeah, so this is how you can time your code. Of course, this can take uh, quite some time if you're using some more complex functions. 
but that is one thing that you can do. Another one um, that you can do, another thing that you can do is you can use the percent PWD command to get the current directory you're in. In my case, this is the one I typed into the terminal. Um, so this can be useful if you forgot where you're working and you want to know, okay, what is the current directory if you have to provide some path to something for debugging purposes or for playing around, you can just type percent PWD to see the current working directory uh, or to print the working directory essentially. Uh, what you can also do is you can, this is actually quite cool, you can export certain cells into their own Python files. So we can type here write file um, cell.py for example and I can say here def my function message print message and then I can call my function actually like that call my function with hello world and if I execute this this is going to be written into cell.py so here we now have cell.py and you can see that this was written into a python script this is kind of useful if you have some more complicated cells and you want to save them for some reason this is a kind of cool thing that you can do um, also one problem that you might have with Jupyter Notebooks is that you forget which cell was executed when and sometimes you execute them in a different order and then you don't understand why a certain value has a certain value or a certain variable has a certain value. Um, so what you can do is you can actually call the history magic command. So percent history. And this is going to show you exactly what you did uh, to get to this point. So we started with that and we executed all these commands to get where we are now. And uh, yeah, that's essentially why the state of the kernel is the state that it is right now. Um, and one last command that I want to show you here is the store command. This is kind of useful if you work with different notebooks. So if we want, for example, to say, I have a list and this list is, I don't know, 5, 10, 15, 20, those are the values. Now I want to store this list into the general memory that can be used by different notebooks. So I can type percent store and I can type my list. Then is uh, this this list is stored. And I can go here and create another notebook, which is not related to the first one. And I can type here percent store dash R. And then I can type my list and you can see that I have my list now in this second notebook. But I don't have, of course, the other uh, variables here. So for example, uh, now I don't have them here, but let me create another one. So if I say other list, one, two, three, four, without storing it, I have it here. I cannot call other list here because it says then doesn't doesn't know it even if I load from the store here, I cannot see that because this is not uh, this list is not saved uh, in the store. So besides that, one thing that is also kind of interesting to know is that you can run commands. So for example, if you want to install something via pip, you don't have to open up the command line, you can type pip, install, whatever. And then this is going to be executed. Now in this case, I hope there is no module. Oh, actually, there is a module called whatever. And now I have it installed on my system. So maybe I should type pip uninstall, whatever. But you can run commands with the exclamation mark here in the Jupyter notebook as well, which is kind of cool, because you don't have to constantly open up the command line to fix certain things or to install certain libraries. Oftentimes, when I have a new computer or a new installation, I type, for example, I want to use Seaborn, I don't have Seaborn. So I just type pip install Seaborn. Um, now, for some reason, this is hanging, so we can interrupt this. And if the interrupt doesn't work, by the way, of course, you can just restart the kernel, you can force it. Uh, and that's actually it. Now, this is most of the stuff you need to know about a Jupyter Notebook. This is kind of cool. Uh, this is quite a cool development environment, in my opinion. One thing that you might have noticed here is that I have Vim bindings in here. This is a whole uh, chapter in and of itself installing plugins, you can use plugins inside of your Jupyter Notebook uh, application. So for example, here I have the Vim plugin, I can use Vim bindings in the Jupyter Notebook. Um, so that's kind of cool. And I have a video on that. So if you want to know how to use Vim bindings inside of the Jupyter Notebook, and you can check out my tutorial on that. Uh, just go to my channel and type Vim Jupyter Notebook and you're going to find it. Um, but yeah, that is how you professionally and properly use Jupyter Notebooks to program in Python. 
So that's it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you learned something. If so, let me know by hitting a like button and leaving a comment in the comment section down below. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and hit the notification bell to not miss a single future video for free. Other than that, thank you much for watching. See you in the next video and bye.